cultural heritage like architecture and art forms the building blocks of national identity. But much of it is on the brink of vanishing. This week on CNA Correspondent, we look at some of the richest remnants of Asia's history and how communities are trying to keep them from fading. The village of Cheongak-dong is one of the last outposts of traditional Korean culture. There's not a skyscraper in sight at this unspoiled hamlet, a four and a half hour drive from Seoul. Instead, many of the 150 villagers still live in traditional houses called Hanok. And this ancient building, for instance, is a school. Those growing up in Cheongak-dong are taught to honor elders and respect their heritage. <laughs> Hanoks were first built in the Joseon dynasty, which began in the 14th century. They were designed to be harmonious with the environment, naturally cooling the house or protecting it from harsh winds, depending on the season. But many were raised to make way for modern developments from the 1980s, victims to the ravages of time. Here we found the Nawajib, unique to hilly regions. This one has shingles made from pine or spruce trees found easily in the surrounding mountains. On the drive to Andong City in South Gyeongsang Province, we saw the other two kinds of hanok. One of them is this, thatched roof. And in the past, Commoners used to live in hanoks like this because they were cheaper to make. Cheaper to build, but harder to preserve as they are more vulnerable to fires and harsh weather. There is also the tiled roof, Kiwachi, where the nobles lived. Bordered by mountains and the Nakdong River, Andong's otherworldly setting becomes evident as we approach. It's the birthplace of the powerful Pungsan Ri clan from the 14th century, whose descendants included politicians and scholars. Today, the clan still makes up more than half the inhabitants in Andong's exquisitely preserved Hawe village. Their hanoks are clearly marked as off-limits to tourists. 그 당시 300가구고 지금 현재는 가구수로 보면 한 126가구 정도 있고 현재 사는 가구들은 한한 90가구 정도 예 사는 있습니다. 저의 생각에는 떠나지는 않을 것 같은데요. Andong City set up the association to safeguard the Hanok village after it was inscribed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 2010. Although there are no specific laws, anyone wanting to modify their Hanoks would first have to discuss it with the city and receive permission. <laughs> An Yong Hwan built the country's first Hanok hotel called Rakoje in Seoul. His second is inside Hawe village. 
and he is in the midst of a long and hard journey to build another near Hawe village from scratch. He wants to build a hano that sticks as closely to tradition as possible. Using only natural materials like local timber and tiles, he chose to build it the olden way with no nails. But like most owners who choose to live in hanoks, he had to adapt the design to keep up with the times. The one of the disadvantages of hanok is uh, the toilet restroom. It's not used, used to have a restroom a toilet inside the room, but you have to put it in. It was the same at his other Hanok Hotel in the modern metropolis of Seoul, where more than 3,000 Hanoks are left standing. Many, including the An's Hotel, are located in Pukchon, where royalty and high-ranking officials used to live. The neighborhood's alleys, lined with hanoks, are a huge tourist draw. And that, in turn, is contributing to a revival of interest in preserving them. Mr. An's son, An Ji Won, now runs the original Rakoje here. The family remodeled it from a 130-year-old hanok while retaining much of its structure. We acquired this hanok in the early 90s, um, and this is actually four separate plots of uh, land. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, hanoks are kind of like tents. They can be completely disassembled and reassembled in a different location. So we disassembled the, in the original four homes and then repositioned them in into this type of uh, courtyard that you see here. The courtyard, or madang in Korean, is a distinct feature of a hanok. The Ans also kept the roof, which was built with a purpose. If you see the um, corners of the roof tiles, the corners will come inwards, so the rain will um, enter into the corners and flow onto that ramp and fall off. But maintaining all this while transforming the aging interiors into a comfortable living space is inconvenient and adds to cost. That's one of the biggest hurdles to conserving Hanoks. For business owners, it's just harder to make good on their investment. It's more expensive to build a hanok on a per square meter basis than an apartment, for example. For a normal build, you can build up, so you'll have six, eight units in, in a particular piece of land. But here, uh, hanoks are single story units. Each year, we close for two weeks and do renovation work on all, all of our properties. Mm -hmm because without that maintenance work, um, you'll see these homes kind of degrade over time and just become unusable. Realizing the historical and cultural importance, the Seoul Metropolitan Government set up a Hanok Heritage Preservation Division in 2001 to support repair and rebuilding expenses. It provides funding of up to 180 million won or about 143,000 US dollars. But for An's family, it's a labor of love, rather than a mere business venture, one that they hope to continue through the ages. So I'm hoping one day one of my children will want to carry this on. Korea can't be seen. Um, it needs to be felt. And the best way to feel what Korean culture is, is to live in one of our homes. <laughs> The South Koreans retraced their roots and rediscovered their identity. The unique architectural form is finding its place in the sun again. This is the last traditional village or kampung left standing on mainland Singapore. Sleepy settlements like this were a way of life before the city's independence in 1965. Bucolic wooden houses gradually made way for slick high-rises. 
except over here at Kampung Lorong Buangkok. I'm on a tour to find out more. So 1956, a gentleman by the name of Mr. Seng Tio Kun bought over this piece of land from the Singapore United Nations Rubber Plantations Limited. This whole entire space was a rubber plantation. In fact, this is the second biggest rubber plantation other than Sembawang. The kampung flourished as plantation workers moved in. Today, Seng's daughter Mui Hong continues its legacy as village chief. Uh, okay. The sprightly 69-year-old has fended off advances from developers offering millions for the land, which is about the size of three football fields. She is not budging, even as she's watched her siblings resettle in public housing flats. Miss Sung shows us around the kampung. And introduces us to some of the 25 families in a tight knit community who pay her as little as 5 US dollars for rent. The door opens and I'm readily invited in. Chik Atun, whose real name is Zaiton, has been living here for close to 70 years and has witnessed its growth and decline. The kampung spirit of warmth and camaraderie is palpable. Villagers take time to show me the sights, relics from a bygone era. Oh, I see this very retro looking signpost. Ah. Lorong Buangkok actually is the name of the road outside. Mm. So once there's, I think there's some road works done by LTA. My brother-in-law, he asked them whether can he take the sign, the signpost. He took the signpost, brought over and placed it here. So now it become very famous signpost everywhere. I see the postal code has only four digits. Four digits, yeah. We started out with two. Then after that, well, as we grew, estate grew, we got one, nine, five, four. But time has not stood still here. The kampung, which has nearly halved in size over the decades, is being squeezed by the threat of encroaching development. The site is earmarked for infrastructure, including a road and schools, though authorities have said there are no plans to carry this out in the near future. The fragility of the kampung can be reflected in the stream of visitors. Dozens came to relive their roots and heritage when borders were closed and vouchers for local tours handed out during the pandemic. But this passing curiosity is ebbing, much like the way of life itself. Not many locals are coming to our tours anymore since the borders are out, so our bookings dropped tremendously. One month, we can only have about like three or four tours. For now, the fate of the village hangs in the balance. You know, we start off with this humble hut. This is very important for the next generation to see. It's a 15-minute boat ride to Singapore's other kampung, where the waves of change are ever so close. Once a thriving community of 3,000 villagers, fewer than 30, many elderly, now live on the island on a daily basis. Hi, Robert. Hi, hi, hi. I meet Robert Teo, my guide for the day. We're going to see how the state preserves the kampung heritage here. 
So Robert, what did NPARCS actually help to restore in this shop house? So for this house, a lot of the timber uh, were found either to be rotten or infested with termites. So uh, we... So all these walls? All these walls, some of the cladding, uh, but mainly, for example, that the roof, mm. uh, the, the whole roof had to be changed. Oh, okay. So some of the, the supporting uh, columns and all that. This was what the building looked like before its first major restoration in about 60 years. Sin Lam Huat Coffee Shop is an Ubin institution. It was passed down in the family to these two sisters. They were born here, but like many others, they've since moved to the mainland. Okay, <laughs> The pandemic is bringing new life to the island. 370,000 people made their way to its shores last year, more than the average of 300,000. Yeah, I like it that it's not so like modern, it's like old and yeah. Their joy at discovering this nostalgic enclave is keeping the hopes of the Ubin folks alive. The days may seem numbered for Singapore's last surviving kampongs, but the spirit of its villagers could help this slice of heritage live on for another day. Ujebajrachavya is breathing life into an ancient form of painting in Nepal called Pauba, an indigenous art made up of deeply spiritual motives. It dates back thousands of years and is crucial in religious rites. Uh, traditionally, we have a Dharma Granta, a spiritual practice, a ritual, a follower. We have a painting, 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 a Traditionally, its practitioners have been using it as a form of meditation. But due to the art form being commercialized, its spiritual aspects and the rituals surround it are slowly fading. 40-year-old Ujjay is determined to bring back the essence of Pauva. He performed a ceremony with the priest to offer prayers to the gods in April last year keeping to strict purification rituals until the painting was done. मेरो आफ्नै पनि म अब बुद्धिज्म पनि अलिअलि प्र्याक्टिस गर्ने भएकोले चाहिँ नि यसको लागि पनि एकदमै आवश्यक जस्तो लागेर मैले यो गर्ने चाहिँ डिसाइड गराए थिएँ त्यतिबेला अब यो रिचुअली फलो गर्दाखेरि चाहिँ त्यही अनुसार एकदमै पावर आको जस्तो यो कम्प्लिट भइसकेपछि चाहिँ एकदमै कम्प्लिट एउटा पितृमनको इच्छा नै पूरा भएको जस्तो uh, wow. Ujjay is part of a wave of Nepali artists who are trying to bring back the glory days of the sacred art. Pauva originated among the Newar people of Kathmandu Valley as early as the 11th century. Raj Prakash Tulather became fascinated with the art after seeing it at religious ceremonies and festivals during his childhood. Raj Prakash even makes his own paints by grinding plants. It's a laborious method that's almost lost now. Manav sari pitre bako, handiko, powder boyo, yakunite, bonus potibo, tea batter on Nicalerani bonaint you. Or oily, other go you bodan my eji available white colored sun bunny. Kuntainly the time pass garton. Raj Prakash didn't grow up with a brush in hand. Unlike most Pova artists, he is from the Tuladar caste of merchants. 
as caste restrictions for Pauva artists gradually vanish, so too do gender stereotypes. Priya Shakya is the fourth generation in her family to be a Pauva artist, but the first who's a woman. I was very lucky that I was at this time, and at that time, everyone was supportive of the environment. I was able to start the work, and I was able to do the work. I was able to do the grandfather, great-grandfather, father, and all the male. I was able to do the work, and I was able to do the work. I was able to do the work, and I was able to do the work, and I was able to do the work. With young Nepalis now free to forge their own paths, families like Priyas, who serve as custodians of Pova, are becoming rare. But the rise of new and more diverse faces is reinvigorating Pova. The works of these neo Pova artists are even seen as a form of investment. Here, at the Museum of Nepali Art, is where one of the most impressive collections of Pova art can be found. The museum hopes to raise awareness among the public and the art collectors who are willing to fork out hundreds of thousands of dollars for the paintings in the international market. Founder Rajan Shakya wants to get visitors to look beyond the visual aspects and see Pova the way it was meant to be interpreted, as a spiritual experience that is crucial to Nepali heritage. This comes at a time when young Nepalis are rediscovering Pova. The Pova art, the originality of the Pova art is there to stay because uh, it is uh, such a strong doctrine uh, of teaching. It has so much to give rather than just a visual effect. Ujjay finished his painting of the Khadcheri Lokeshwara in August. The priest consecrated the painting, and it is now an object of worship inside the museum. Through Pawa art, centuries ago, families passed on knowledge, passed on faith, passed on beliefs. So to retain this is to know your past, and to retain this is the definition of yourself, of who you are today. You, can, you cannot forget this, and you should not let the future also forget this. Ujjay has committed to painting the way his ancestors did for the rest of his life. His wish is to see the traditions behind Pauva become as valuable as the art itself.